Hi there, welcome back. And now for something completely different. Um, I've done this before on my channel, just basically something completely unrelated to what I usually do. But um, actually this is pretty close to what I usually do. I do all sorts of things. I play with electronics of every sort, every variety. And in this case, it's a mixer. It's a mixing uh, preamp. And <laughs> This belongs to a client of a friend of mine. This friend of mine has a music store and a music school, and the client brought it in, really quite despondent about its future. This thing looked in pretty grummy shape, as you'll see in a second. What you're seeing here is the result after I've finished with it. So this is after the fact. But this got me thinking about the repair aspect of uh, electronics. We are living in a society which, as you probably know, is basically, uh, you know, disposable, everything is disposable, everything is sold incredibly cheaply, relatively cheaply, so it becomes very, very difficult when you want to try and keep something alive. Uh, very often you go on and look for the cost of something new and it's cheaper than it would cost to repair. There, this is where hobbyists come in. Um, I do this as a hobby, so I'm not looking at the clock. And it doesn't really matter, matter to me how long I take with this thing, as long as I enjoy doing it. And I do enjoy doing it. Believe it or not, <laughs> cleaning something and making it look new is something that gives me enormous satisfaction. I've tried with myself, it doesn't really work. But with equipment, you can do that. And again, this might seem like a little bit of a philosophizing video, and I've been criticized very recently <laughs> for doing that. But hey, this is what I enjoy doing. So that's what I'm showing. The fact that some of these things are dumped way before their due date or way before they should be dumped is to me a crying shame. I think that we're basically getting to the point where we've got to start looking at making it viable to repair. It's not easy because if you look at some of the, uh, the uh, technician costs that most European countries and the States as well, obviously, uh, are forced to charge to give people a living wage, it becomes very difficult to make it viable to repair one of these. So maybe someone can figure out a way of, uh, I don't know, sponsoring repairmen, uh, getting rid of some of the taxes the, the repairmen have to pay, whatever, just whatever. We need to get to the point where we start saving these things. Now, when you look at this, and I'm going to show you this in a second, <laughs> you might believe when you start looking at it that it may well have been a better idea to just dump it. But I'm looking at it now, and I'll show you this at the end, obviously, completed. And believe me, it was worth the job. It was worth the hours I put into it. I'll tell you at the end exactly how many hours I've taken and what it probably would have cost if you took this to a repair business. Someone who's got to pay rent and electricity and, and staff and taxes and all that sort of thing, insurance. It probably would not be worth it. But I'm blabbing on as usual, philosophizing as usual. And uh, let's uh, see if we can arrive at some conclusion during this video. This is a 16-channel mixer that's being used in a restaurant that, uh, besides the background music, also sometimes has live shows. So they've got singers, they've got uh, instruments connected on here. And this thing has been through the ringer. Uh, the owner brought it in, complaining that some of the functions weren't working. And if we look closely, we can sort of understand why. I think this thing has probably been the uh, food taster in the restaurant. It's probably received samples of every dish on the menu, as well as every drink that was on the bar. It really does look grotty, and um, it's actually quite surprising that it worked at all. When we look at this thing, you sort of wonder, well, you know, is this thing savable? Can it really have a life beyond uh, this mess? I think uh, when the owners brought it in, they were sort of expecting the owner of the store to say, you know, dump it, get a new one. And I think most people would probably suggest that. But um, this uh, store is owned by a friend of mine, and he knows that I'm a little crazy for these things. I like restoring them. So he challenged me to, to try and repair this. Now, this thing is actually something that you would expect to be, you know, 20, 25 years old, but it's not. Surprisingly enough, it's actually let's call it fairly modern. So modern, in fact, that it's still on sale as new in some of the outlets selling music equipment. Here's one from uh, Tolman, you know, 500 something euros, 400 something pounds. That's about close to $600. It's not just Tolman. There are a few other places that have it. 
So the idea here is to see whether we can resurrect it and at the same time focus attention on the one problem we're facing these days and that is the viability, the financial viability of repairing electronic equipment when you can actually buy stuff for relatively cheap uh, prices where, whereas the actual labor costs to repair these things can be quite high. Justifiably so, technicians have to live. Now as a hobbyist I don't worry about that but one has to look at this and uh, imagine what would a professional restorer have to charge and would that be worth it? Perhaps we'll arrive at some conclusion by the end of this video. If you've done one of these before you'll know that um, one of the main problems with uh, repairing these things is actually opening it up and getting it all out and uh, it gets quite messy. But uh, the initial stages are quite easy. I've just taken a lot of photos to make sure that I get everything in the right place put all the connectors back in the right position, all the screws in the right place and so on. But you very quickly get everything out that's necessary to remove the or to get access to the boards. And once you get the boards out, which of course requires that you take every single knob and every single nut from those uh, jacks out, you see what we have inside. It's quite distressing. What I've done is I've also taken photographs to make sure that I get the, the knobs back in the right place. And you can see the, uh, the panel needs to be completely clean or remote uh, or devoid of any knobs and so on. So you can actually clean it properly because you would just not get to those little nooks and crannies without it. You also obviously need to get access to the, to the inside so that you can clean the pots. And there are a lot of them, <laughs> a lot of them. This thing is, um, this is pot paradise, man. And if you can get in there, this is what you're left with. You've got your boards out. You've got access to all the grime and dirt in there that you can brush away. And that's just the start. But um, as you can see, this thing collects a lot of stuff that goes in through all the little holes. And the first thing I did was actually got all the knobs together, put them in a bag, put them in a washing machine. My wife was quite uh, surprised that I wanted to actually use the washing machine. And the result was actually pretty good. This is what came out. Now, since the main problem with this board, with this mixer, was that uh, the controls were scratchy, the switches were failing. I've seen this before. I've done this before. Generally, there's nothing wrong with the actual electronics. And that means that what you need to do is just to clean everything thoroughly. And the way I do that is uh, by spraying in contact cleaner on all the pots, starting with the slider pots, you spray it in and you flex them or move them up and down quite a few times. Usually the first time around is just to loosen everything up. You can actually feel the thick grime disappear. And remember, all you've done here is you've actually just loosened that grime. Most of it is still going to stay there. So it's not enough to just spray it and leave it. But the first way, the first time around, that's basically what you do. And be careful what contact cleaner you use. The one I use has got no residue. I would imagine it's more um, isopropyl alcohol than anything else. I know that uh, X-Ray Tony did a video recently where he describes and explains why using the oxid on carbon pots is not a good idea. It actually wears away the carbon track. And what he does is he actually goes in there, dismantles each pot, literally dismantles each pot, and cleans it thoroughly inside without just sort of spraying and leaving. But um, in this case, you can't really do that. I mean, the number of pots that you have here and the size of these pots just makes that impossible. So it's better to find a good contact cleaner that's got to be very, very thin because these pots don't actually have holes in them. The spray that you're spraying in there just goes through the shaft. And as you start turning it, you can actually feel it. You can feel the, uh, the sort of the, the tightness of the turn become looser. And you do that quite a few times and you just keep going all the way through one at a time. Take your time. And as you're doing that, you're also actually just loosening some of the grime that hasn't been brushed away because obviously you brush as much as you can away first. And then, of course, there are the switches as well. Some of these switches were not springing back. Some of them were not making contact when you push them in, but mostly they weren't springing back. And that's because some of the, the grease, some grease has got in, whether it's from the food or from previous lubrification, I don't know. But when you spray this contact cleaner and it does break that down, and if you activate that switch enough times, that generally loosens it up. 
but you have to do it to every switch. You can actually get to these switches and to these spots when you put it back onto the faceplate, but it's not a good idea. It's, it's more difficult that way. So it's better to do it when you have it all out and you can see it. One other thing, this is the first time around. You won't get away, or you can, but you probably won't do a good job if you just do this once. So what I normally do is after doing this whole procedure on all the pots, on, on all the boards, and in this case there are three boards, one big one and two smaller ones, I leave it for a few hours, come back and do it all over again. And you'll find that when you come back, some of those pots have got back their, their stiffness. So some of that uh, grease is, back, is dried up again. So you break it down again. That's all you can do. I suppose, and maybe some of you would have a different suggestion, you could put this in some, some sort of bath. I don't know. I've done a bath and wash before, but that was with uh, components that I knew that I could get to with alcohol afterwards to dry them up properly. But this is the way I do it, and this is the way I think is probably the best way to do it, which is um, one contact, one pot at a time. It's laborious, it's slow, but you know, if you've got some good music on in your headphones and um, you've got nothing else to do, it's, it's actually quite uh, a good stress relief. So this is it. Instead of meditation, clean pots. And once I've done that, I've actually found a spray, which is 96% alcohol. And I want to just do a clean up. I just want to do a final spray to um, try and get rid of any dirt that uh, the previous procedure has brought to the surface. I spray it on. I spray quite, quite vigorously. And um, what tends to happen is uh, the, the, the alcohol starts draining down to the bottom and takes a lot of the dirt with it. So uh, that's the next step. It tends to come out very, very well. OK, so you've now got the boards cleaned up. You've got the pots cleaned up. You've got the switches cleaned up. And of course, you've got the faceplate cleaned up. Now, in this particular case, what I did was I took that um, faceplate and I put it on the sink and I got some uh, dishwasher liquid, nothing too strong, and just washed it down after checking that none of the um, labeling was coming off. You've got to be very, very careful with that. If you use anything too aggressive, I think even alcohol can get rid of that uh, labeling. I'll tell you what, with a mixer with this number of controls, you do not want the, uh, the labeling to be washed away. Believe me. So then putting it back in, you've got to be careful, make sure everything fits nicely. I start putting the screws in. I don't put them all at the same time. I just uh, start putting them in a few at a time. Get everything nicely lined up. Make sure that you're not forcing anything. One thing you've got to be careful with is the, uh, the LEDs. They've got to fit right snugly into those little holes or they bend. And you suddenly find you've wired everything up. You put everything back on and your one LED is uh, bent double. So yeah, that's basically where we are. We get everything back in the, uh, in the faceplate, make sure everything is nice and tight, start tightening all the, uh, the uh, nuts on the jacks. There are a lot of them. Take your time and just get the thing done. And then, of course, there's the <laughs> really slow and tedious process of putting all the knobs back in and all the uh, switches. It's, again, nothing nothing spectacular, just time consuming. As you can see from the board, I'd already done the half of it, which was uh, those two smaller boards. I put the knobs in after I put those boards in, so I do this thing progressively. It's uh, just a question of looking up photos again, making sure you get the right colors in place, because some people do follow that, and you want to get this thing as uh, perfect as possible. The one thing I did notice was there are two little knobs on the uh, equalizer that are missing. I checked on the initial photos. Uh, they were missing as well. So the result of this whole exercise was zero losses. I was left with no extra screws and I was left with no shortage of knobs or switches, which, believe me, is a miracle. And the only way that worked is I put things in little containers as I took them out. Very, very careful because you do lose these things. And if you do, there's nothing worse than having a mixer that is uniform except for some strange knobs that you had to find to replace the ones you lost. And when you lose something in a workshop like mine, you will not find them till a year later. So yeah, that's it. We've got the uh, whole faceplate done. We've got all the knobs in. We've got everything basically done, put back together, 
And now it's just a question of putting it into the enclosure, into the back, get the uh, connectors back in place. I took some photos initially so that I can get them in place exactly the way they were. I know that um, I have to be very careful there because, you know, getting this, getting the thing done and then finding you've forgotten to connect something is a pain in the, in the butt. I know I've done it before. I try to avoid it. And uh, that's it. That's it. The magic has been done. And here we have the final result. Quite an amazing transformation. I'm sure you'll agree. It's been done. When I think of the number of knobs I had to remove, clean, put in, it's, it's really amazing when you look at it now. The point is, I feel pretty much satisfied with the result. There is one more thing, one more very important thing and I still need to do, and that is to test it. Test every single channel, which is not something I'm going to put you through. I mean, I've put you through too many fast forwards already, uh, you know, 16 times speed video and so on. And that brings me to the other point. The number of hours I spent on this, <laughs> I think I lost track a bit, but it must have been about, what, six hours? Probably six, six and a half hours. And I still am not finished. As I said, I still need to test this. Testing each channel could probably take me another hour or so. Let's call it seven hours total. Now, if this was a professional, I'm sure he wouldn't take that long. But, and he'd probably have some special tools that will make his life a lot easier than, than mine was. But the point is, it's taken me a lot of hours. And whichever way you look at it, if this went to a professional repair shop, it would not be viable for less than, you know, six hours of invoicing, seven hours of invoicing. And whatever value you take, uh, I don't know. I don't know what they charge where you are, but um, in Madeira, if you get a computer tech, he charges you 50, 60 euros an hour. Now, there are a lot of computer techs. There are not a lot of electronic techs. So as you follow the uh, law of supply and demand, an electronics tech should charge more. However, there is not that much demand for repairs, so he has to charge less. So it's a vicious circle. He has to charge less, so few and few, fewer and fewer people are inclined to, to go into that profession. So the whole thing just gets you know, worse. So would someone pay, you know, 400 bucks, you know, six hours, seven hours, plus uh, the number of spray um, cleaner that, that, that you use? I, I don't think so. I mean, if, if they're going to spend 400 bucks to repair something like this, they just buy a new one for 455 or whatever it was, or 555. So again, we're back to the same argument. Uh, repairs of electronic consumer electronic equipment is just not viable the way things are today. And therefore... There are idiots like me who like the challenge, who take a lot of the their income from the satisfaction of doing this, um, and we can do it. And professionally, I don't think it's viable for anybody to go into this uh, line of business. If you're going to live from this, you're going to starve. And as you can see, I'm I'm sort of rather plump, so I don't live I, I don't live off this. I would like to see more and more people getting into the field. I'm seeing more and more people getting into the sort of the uh, computer tech side, a lot of uh, engineers coming out of universities with uh, computer uh, technology and computer knowledge, computer engineering, not in this field, not in repairs. And that's a crying shame. Anyway, enough uh, philosophizing for now. Hope this has given you food for thought. Hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and if you've enjoyed it, please click like. If you haven't enjoyed it, click dislike twice. And uh, I hope to see you back soon for another video. I'll be starting the restoration of that uh, Telefunken soon. So that should be going a little bit back to the normal, the normal of this channel for a while. But anyway, once again, thanks for your patience. Hope you've enjoyed that. And thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.